Hello everybody, this is Fredge K for Guided Hacking and today we're going to be doing a sequel to my video where I took a look at a Python malware builder. If you haven't already seen that video, watch that one before this one. But in this video, we're going to be taking a look at the actual malware that this builder generated and how people are beginning to implement malware within Python, which isn't a super common thing to be seen. Usually it's done by newer maldevs because it's easier to write code within python than it is to write code within c or c plus plus or c sharp and this python malware isn't great in what it does but it does function for a basic entry threat actor so we're going to take a look and we'll see how it achieves its functionality before i go on the main way this works is it's initially targeting windows os's but not every windows os comes with a python install so what the threat actors will make use of is PyTEXE, which is a bundling software which will compile Python and then wrap it with the Python runtime so that everything kind of functions within a binary. These binaries are quite large, but with modern day internet connections, sizes of binaries don't really make that much of a difference anymore. So let's get into looking at some of the functionalities within this malware. I'm just going to go from top to bottom. It's quite a short um, Python file and I'll just comment on some of the functionalities that they've implemented starting with the request admin permissions so this admin permissions function is used to get the administrator runtime privileges for a binary and it'll do this by using the C types library and then checking if the shell 32 process is an admin and if not, it'll execute with shell execute w the run as command looking for the system executable. And it'll run this as administrator. And then if it's not an administrator, it will exit. Going down the list, we also see that there are some commands within PowerShell that are being executed with the sub process open command this will open a sub process out of the parent process with the given commands and these will be powershell get net adapter and then disable the net adapter and there's also a function to enable the net adapter as well going down the list there's more functionalities here which just support the larger functions within this malware and we can see the rdp stealer being implemented here so it'll first call a check of is RDP enabled. And the way it does this is it creates a socket to the local listening RDP session, which is always on 3389. So if it can connect to the local 3389 port, it assumes that RDP is enabled. Obviously this is not foolproof because if another service is running on that port, then it's going to still detect it as RDP. The get RDP function will check if the process is admin, if RDP is enabled, and if it is Windows. I'm unsure why it would be doing a check for is Windows when the binary is being packaged as an executable, unless they were attempting to maybe implement this as both functionalities for attacking Linux systems or Mac OS systems you would probably presume that your malware is being run on a Windows system. Also, looking through the commands, a lot of these commands are Windows specific. Anyway, the malware will then run a sub-process of Windows guest, net user Windows guest, and then the if the username exists, then it'll say that it exists and that it's already hijacked it with a non-specified password. So this will just be a guest login. And then if the user doesn't exist, then it's going to set a password of none and it will simply just add the windows guest to administrators and allow for windows guest to be added to the rdp so what it's going to be doing is adding a fake user to the infected systems rdp and then send the send the results on the telegram channel that was specified within the malware there's more functions that interact with telegram such as killing certain tasks and this will zip up a given directory It'll run an anti-analysis. So these anti-analysis functions are certainly interesting. It will first call WMI and then WMI again to detect if the machine is virtual machine. It'll also see if it can detect the debugger by calling is debugger present and then check remote debugger present from the Win32 libraries. This is certainly quite common. And detecting sandboxy by trying to get a module handle of sandboxy dll.dll. .dll 
which is a common running DLL when you have Sandbox installed. It also has some process killers. So it will look at all of the processes on the system and then check if they either contain process hacker or task manager. And if they do, they'll just kill those processes. Some of you may be wondering, how do you learn malware analysis and how you can do the same as I do in these videos? Well, if you're prepared to put in the hard work and time, then I recommend that you go and check out the amazing content on the Guided Hacking website. There is an insane amount of technical content specifically regarding reverse engineering. So go check out Guided Hacking as your one-stop shop for all things reverse engineering. Going on, we see some Bitcoin wallet information and other information being set. And then we get to the Chrome class here, which is, a, which is just a copy and paste of a Chrome password stealer that can be found on GitHub. Sadly, my decompiler was unable to get the decompile output of this, but if you look up Python Chrome password stealer, you'll find the exact code for this. It'll then create a logs directory and change the attributes of it to hidden. It'll get the active window title, and then on key press, it will get the active window title, the time, and then write to the login directory with that time. And this is just a key logging functionality with the window, the key and the time. This is going to absolutely spam a Telegram channel. So this is not the smartest of implementations of a keylogger because it's going to create a new line for every key that is pressed. To get cookies, it does the standard functionality of stealing from Chrome by just looking at the login vaults and then using the master password to decrypt them and then bundling those up and sending them over to Telegram. Send file is normal. All of these are just interact with the Telegram API and then just hitting the Telegram send document or send message API point to send either a message or a document to a Telegram chat. This is very common nowadays because you see a lot of malware making use of Telegram as a C2. Going on, just more imported libraries to take a screenshot of the system and that'll just be saved in the logs folder. Getting the location of the system is as simple as sending a request to a API with the IP address of the infected system. Sysinfo is just calling some functions that will get information about the infected system with some things misspelled here. The B Bitcoin Clipper is simply just a PowerShell script which will be ran and that'll just wait for the clipboard and then replace the clipboard with the correct Bitcoin wallet. The code for this isn't too crazy. It's simply just a regex on the clipboard value. And then if the regex matches, it's just going to replace what's in the clipboard. Simple PowerShell. Again, the history is as simple as opening the local storage of a Chromium browser and then just executing some SQLite commands to select the URL title and so on. And with Discord, it's as simple as just grabbing the tokens and copying and pasting them into the filled logs into that zip. Because if you have the files from the Discord store, you can just copy and paste them into a Discord session. So this malware isn't too complicated at all. The anti-analysis is somewhat interesting but besides that all of this is standard copy and paste that you would find from any implementation of a python malware and a lot of this common malware that you being you see being sold on lower level forums it's all just going to be copy and paste of stack overflow answers you can see that there's a huge amount of imports at the start of this and this is going to create the pi to exe output of binary to be somewhat massive because it's going to have all of these libraries that pi to exe has to bundle with it but the functionality of this malware is also incredibly loud. All of these processes, process open, normal commands to PowerShell and CMD processes and dropping PS1 files and then executing them will be super detectable for any EDR or AV. So this isn't going to be some high level malware that can be used by a advanced persistent threat or really anybody that's actually trying to infect quite a lot of systems successfully because this seems very unreliable. I don't see any kind of error checking or handling if some if one of these commands fails. So this in practice, if you dropped it on 100 machines, probably about 50% of them it would exit because some of this code will have issues with different file paths and also not being able to handle if there's an error, it will just throw an exception and exit. Now, after my last video, the creators of this Python malware had seen the video and in their Telegram channel, 
decided to disband the malware and stop developing malware because I, in theory, had exposed them, which is incredibly interesting. It's good to know that when you expose some malware, there's a chance of them disbanding and stopping their development process. Anyway, I hope that it was an interesting video nonetheless. If you enjoyed this video, a like would help a lot and subscribe to be notified of future uploads. If you haven't already, check out guidedhacking.com for a step-by-step -step introduction to game hacking and an ever-growing catalogue of content. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.